very happy to be here in, besides Augusta. Uh, my talk is mostly about cyber innovations or innovations in general. Uh, very quick polling of the audience. I actually like to just get to know my audience when I give these talks. Uh, folks who are cyber professionals, cyber security professionals. Good. Yeah, about half three. Yeah, this tends to be more professional. Hackers. Any hackers in this audience? Okay. Yeah. Pen testers, hackers. Yeah. Okay. We have a few. I didn't see as many di uh, dyed hair for this conference. So to me, that's the indicator of I'm more of a hacker conference or more of a cyber professional. What about first time attendees? First time attendees? Oh, wow. First time, B first time B sides? Yeah, great. Yeah, I know. and again, uh, we have uh, cadets, or actually second lieutenants, right? We have second lieutenants from uh, uh, Bullock out of Fort Gordon, it's great. Um, high school, are you in high school? Elementary school? Middle. Middle school, excellent. Any other? Yeah, okay, great. That is, hopefully this presentation uh, doesn't blow your mind too much away. Because I, I geared this presentation for second graders. And I found that this presentation worked better for second graders than I did originally. And Mike Nokas is going to verify this. You're going to be my uh, gauge. Because he actually moderated the first time I presented uh, the very first version of this talk. So that was for 15 minutes. That was a very hasty <laughs> presentation. Uh, personally, I actually think this, this room is the best room of all the tracks, right? This is the Whistler and Mother room, right? Sneakers, right? Anyone? I know, I know I know someone who's not seen sneakers, so this is a uh, pitch for sneakers. I tell all the cadets I teach at West Point, I teach system engineering. I'm giving them all cyber projects, so I, I not finally have TAs. At West Point, they don't give us TAs. So we teach for free, we get paid a grade. So we don't have any TAs, so that's what I do. I, I use my cadets now to work on all my cyber projects. And I'll bring that up a little bit later. But of the four movies, I tell all my, my cadets to watch. Sneakers is one. War Games is the other, so you've already seen War Games. Uh, Real Genius and Matrix, you've seen the Matrix as well. So Real Genius and Sneakers, that's, that's your homework assignment. And so if you're taking my class, that's your homework assignment. Don't read anything, just watch the movies. And you'll see why as this presentation goes along. Uh, let's see, uh, very quickly, uh, I work at the, this organization called the Army Cyber Institute. We're located at West Point, New York. I told you I was an instructor there, a professor and I teach system engineering. Uh, but this very qu quick video from the CNET, they did a nice job uh, talking about, ooh, it is closing out. Yeah, let me uh, exit out of here and then close that one out. So you can see the video. Yeah, I'm just gonna delete that. Yeah, here we go. So CNET did this really nice video uh, you can call it propaganda if you want, but uh, it actually does a nice job so I don't have to explain it, right? Everyone asks me, what, what is the Army Cyber Institute? So. What is the future of cyber attacks? And what's the military mean? Let's see if I can adjust the volume as well. I think I might have adjusted my volume on mine as well. Yeah, bring this is up. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. Fail to quality control my uh, equipment. Government equipment, that's what it is. I'm blaming on the government. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works the third time. Yeah, a little better. No, reload, reload. What is the future of cyber attacks? And what's the military doing about it? We visited West Point, the Army's prestigious 200-year-old military academy, to watch the annual cyber defense exercise, dubbed CDX, a yearly competition among service academies to see which teams can protect their servers from NSA hackers. People are starting to realize that we built all these things that we're not relying on, but we sort of built it out in front of the idea of security. And so things are kind of getting away from us. And now I need to take some time to kind of ratchet it back and figure out how we're going to manage this really complex world we built. The West Point team spent months creating a server that could handle email, file transfers, and other services for thousands of simulated users. For several days, the group of two dozen cadets huddled together in a computer lab to guard their systems against exploits from the NSA. 
So uh, the cadets are part of an extracurricular uh, activity. It's not a class. Developing new things and being able to protect something that's so important in our everyday life is definitely crucial. A scoreboard was projected in the front, showing how well Armin was faring against competing teams, with grades based on how well each group maintains its network. Naturally, the Army team streamed their activities live on Twitch. The top team takes home this big shiny trophy. This year, though, Army's big rival, Navy, won. Any Navy We're affiliates here, here? To visit the Army Cyber Institute, uh, which is a new think tank. Navy, okay, we've got Navy. All the different questions. Uh, Air Force? What the future Air of Force? cyber defense may be. Army? We, we met its director, Colonel yeah, yeah, Andrew good. Hall. He talked Marines. about the Army's efforts to predict Coast potential Guard. ways the country Coast could face Coast an attack, Guard. a concept yeah. called threat casting, now that internet connections are just about everywhere. With threat casting, you're, just, you're trying to put yourself into what the attack surface would look like. In so that's my boss? Because we know the attack surface is going to be huge. He went on to describe a series of potential cyber threats we may face in the future such as a personal care robot being hacked and harming its owner. Yeah, we already know about that, right? You saw a couple of presentations on that. Catastrophic disaster. Pulse Think Tank is also considering the potential of some pretty sci-fi concepts, like augmented soldiers and autonomous drones. One of the main efforts we've been doing is trying to figure out how the army will bring cyber and cyber effects to the battlefield. I don't know if it's terrifying or comforting, that high-level army officials are thinking about robot attacks and bionic soldiers. And sure, cyber attacks may worsen, but efforts like these should help the military prepare a little more for what's coming. <laughs> There's supposed to be a part two coming out in the next month or so, uh, so if you have to go to this link or just uh, go to Yahoo and do, do a CNET search for West Point Sci-Fi Army, uh, it should pop up. Um, but really what I'm talking about here today is just about really thinking about innovation. And really, I think innovation, if you read the abstract in the book, is, is really, I think innovation is really driving really our U.S. competitive advantage. Really, really since our inception, right? Inception of uh, our nation. Um, but a lot of folks talk about it. How many folks actually study it? And do we actually know how to make better innovations? And that's really what I'm talking about here. I don't think of innovations as a monolithic entity. I break it down. I break it down into two, uh, four quadrants. Any business majors in the audience? Business majors? Yeah, so if you're a business major, you know you can break out any, right? You can break out the world in four quadrants. And that's what I've done, right? Uh, so I've broken it out uh, based on two criteria. One is the level of complexity or a sophistication with the technology. And the other is the target market, or what users want to use, right? Whether it's new user or existing users. And really on this lower left-hand quadrant, what I call that, right, low complexity, but existing users, I'm calling that sustaining types of innovation, okay? On the high side of the technology, high complexity, I'm calling that evolutionary or incremental innovation, right? Think of Darwin, that's what I'm thinking, evolutionary innovation. What about high side new markets, new new users? I call that breakthrough. Right? That's why I love who's my Air Force Air Force guy? Yeah, there we go. Air Force does that really well. I'm gonna show you why a little later. Uh, but I'm actually focusing on this one one quadrant right here, right? When it's low technological complexity, right? Very simple things, but new users. I am calling that revolutionary innovation, right? I actually want you to think of revolutions. That's the analogy I'm going to use, right? Revolutionary warfare, right? There are a couple of hard business professors that coined this term disruptive innovations. That's what I like it, liken it to, right? Revolutionary disruptive innovations are things that are low tech but target new users. Okay, well, so what does this mean, right? So I'm going to help, hopefully try to explain what each of these um, quadrants are in a more simplistic manner. Okay? When I think of, right, this notion of breakthrough or really high tech innovation, a lot of folks think that's the only types of innovation that are out there. I can guarantee you some folks in this room think that way. Especially, probably not in this room, probably the folks outside, the vendors, they probably think innovation can only come from high tech. Right? Very expensive, a lot of R&D, okay? But I'm gonna argue with that, right? I think, right? Unfortunately, that's the unfortunate part, right? That's the way a lot of people think about this. I'm gonna argue, Right? And unfortunately, right, in the military, right, in the military, 
a lot of our leaders only think that uh, only breakthrough innovation, right? I told you the Air Force does that really well, the breakthrough stuff. Well, <laughs> that's the only type of innovation that exists. I'm going to try to counter this with, this with this presentation here. I'm thinking revolutionary sustaining innovations are just as powerful, okay? Really to power our, our nation uh, against cyber threats. Okay, so how, how, do I, how am I thinking about this? So again, I'm not going to introduce myself in my slides. I'm going to introduce myself as the slides go on. I'm a military intelligence officer, so I think generally in terms of threats, okay, that's what the, the twos do, right? The A2s, the N2s, the S2s, G2s. Um, when I think of sustaining innovations, the one character that comes immediately to my mind is Spock, right? Star Trek fans? Yeah, good. Spock, right? He's very logical. Um, he's going to give Captain Kirk the courses of action that have the highest probability of success, right? Even if it means, in one instance, right, sacrifice himself, right? That was Star Trek II, right? The movie Star Trek II. Sacrifice himself. Um, what about evolutionary innovation? Any Mad Magazine fans in the audience? Remember Spy versus Spy? That's what I'm thinking of evolutionary, right? The black spy is trying to kill the white spy, and every episode, right, one wins over another just by doing something that upwits the other spy. What about breakthrough, high-tech stuff? I mentioned the Air Force, but really, from the movies, the character that comes immediately to my mind is James Bond. James Bond gets all the high-tech Gizmos from the quartermaster division out of MI6. They have resources of all Great Britain. They give them all these cool toys. And I'm really thinking Piers Brosnan, right? I'm thinking Piers Brosnan, the uh, when he's controlling the BMW with his uh, little gamepad, right? With a cell phone at the time, right? He's got the watch that cuts through whatever it is that needs to right, save the day. So he's got all the high tech toys. What about revolutionary innovation? Does that even exist? Revolutionary innovation. Do we have any characters that come to mind? For me, now, I know I'm dating myself here, MacGyver, right? What did he have? He had a Swiss Army knife. He had the gum in his pocket. Well, actually, the gum that he was chewing, right? He had some paper clips. I don't know why he carries paper clips in his pocket. Uh, but right, he has that pencil, that graphite lead that he uses. Right, whatever is at his disposal. Now, I know that we have some younger <coughs> audience members here. So again, if you don't know MacGyver, now, yeah, they're having a remake of it. I actually, I haven't seen it. I saw one half of an episode. I saw where he pulled out the uh, Swiss Army knife. So I said, okay, that's MacGyver. I had to turn it off because I was a jet lag. And I thought, okay, that's close enough. But I pulled the eye and said, yeah, it's not that good. So if you don't know MacGyver and you don't want to watch the remake, I know you've seen this, right? You've seen Jason Bourne. So Jason Bourne is disruptive, right? He's revolutionary. He's using whatever tools are at his disposal to save his own life, right? Or his friend's life. Now, one of these characters really doesn't re belong here. Right? I told you I'm an MI officer, military intelligence threat. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but really Spock doesn't belong here. So, sorry Spock, I'm gonna have to uh, send you away. Now, the character I'm thinking is Mission Impossible, but I'm not thinking, I am not thinking, right, I am not thinking Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. Tom Cruise Mission Impossible is breakthrough. He's got all the neat gizmos, right? I think that was from Rogue Nation, where he's climbing that highest tower with that glove, right? He's like playing Spider-Man. Well, of course, it breaks a little, right? It gives out a few times, so he's slipping up. But I'm thinking for, instead of Spock for sustaining, I am thinking Mission Impossible, the television series. Remember, Leonard Nimoy played Paris. In Mission Impossible, right, he spoke like 10 different languages. It was just a variation of English, just spoken in different dialects. I remember watching one episode, he actually played a Japanese ambassador. So he was portraying a Japanese accent. It sounded very funny to me. I'm Chinese, but it still sounded funny to me. Uh, but I think it was for the uh, benefit of the audience, so you could understand what he was doing. Uh, but really, the entire MI uh, Mission Impossible forces, they were sustaining. Right? If you remember the Peter Phelps character, he's picking the best uh, human assets he, he can to con these governments out of their secrets or doing bad things. You might need that for North Korea, I think. Uh, but again, going to, going to Tom Cruise fan, I asked, I sort of made fun of Tom Cruise, but any Tom Cruise fans in here? No Tom Cruise fans. No one, went, no one saw uh, Jason's presentation on, on uh, presentations, human, human persuasion? Yeah, uh, I saw his presentation, I had to change mine. So in the 15 minutes I had, I had to include, right, revolutionaries, Tom Cruise getting top gun, right? So if, you, if you're a big fan of top gun, now I 
can't sing as well as Jason, so I have to use this. See, Jason was doing that with his voice, right? Uh, I have to use soundtrack. So if you haven't seen Top Gun, Top, see Top Gun. Well, I have a different take on it. Slightly different take than what Jason had. Well, I'm sure glad sound is working in here. I'm by all the other, uh, I need to pipe the sound over to the next building. So, yeah, coming over on this side. All right, so if you can read this, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Let me bring this down. Let me see if I can bring that down now. Oops. Uh, let's see, there we go. All right, so Top Gun, right? Uh, that's why I really want to know who the Navy folks and the Air Force folks were. If you read this, on March 3rd, 1969, the US Navy established this program. Right? It's called Top Gun. In the Vietnam War, the US pilots, both Air Force and Navy, were suffering so many casualties. We had about 1,000 um, casualties, POWs, planes being shot down uh, from 1965 to 1968, that they suspended air operations for a full year. Department of Defense said we can't sustain this, right? The Russians just had so many, so many more pilots, so many more aircraft. We couldn't sustain that war in the air fight with them. So the Department of Defense suspended all op air operations, right? No more bombings, no more dogfights in the air. What the Navy did, right? What the Navy did was they, they created Top Gun. You create this right down to San Diego, Miramar. You create this school so that you're fighting, right? US pilots are fighting against tactics of the Russian MiG-21s and the MiG-17s that are at the time. We're, they were doing pretty good, three to one uh, fatality rates, right? For every one pilot we, we, we set up the skies, we shot down three Russian pilots. But that was not good enough. The Russians just had so much more pilots than we did. We would use our, use our air force abilities. What did the Air Force do? What is the Air Force always like? <coughs> they like high tech, right? We need better weapon systems. We need to build right, longer range systems on our F-4 fans. We need to build bigger thrust. So the Air Force went technology, high tech. Okay. Navy went low tech, revolutionary. Interesting thing here, um, there's a book. I, I, I gave the uh, citation out to my cadets. I can't remember what the name of it. But if you actually Google this, right? Google Top Gun, the real Top Gun, not the movie. Um, amazing outcomes. For the Air Force, right, when they got their new F-4 Phantoms upgraded, their kill ratio stayed about three to one. That next year, when we introduced the, uh, the uh, air platforms back in Vietnam, it stayed about three to one. It actually dipped a little bit, but it was statistically insignificant. Right? The pilots just didn't know how to use the new weapon system. They weren't well trained there. Uh, but uh, three to one, still not bad. Navy, the Navy pilots who went through Top Gun, and actually, that spread it was about an eight to 10 week course. So again, not every pilot went through it. But do you know what the stats were for the Navy pilots? Three to one was the original stat, right? It shot up, 1969, 17 Russian kills to one Navy pilot. Huge difference, right? That's, right, I don't, I'm, you don't need to be a mathematician to know that statistic is significant, right? Going from the three to one to the 17 to one. Just by doing, disruptive innovation. Okay, that's my take on Top Gun. So the alternate talk, uh, a title of this talk was uh, what I learned about innovation from watching Top Gun. But the B-Sides folks didn't like that, so I stuck with my original title. Let's see, again, this is not from a mathematician's perspective, right? This whole notion of even carve out the world into four quadrants that the business schools teach us. Yeah, so again, as a system engineer, I kind of like more numbers, right? I kind of like having the numbers, because I tell my cadets, hey, what is the client research in? What are the numbers? Okay, so eh, still not from a mathematician's perspective, but if I add one more quadrant, right, to or one more uh, access to my technology complexity and then uh, targeted market, targeted users, I add now offset potential. How can this innovation drastically alter the environment? Well, what are those innovations that alter the environment? It's the ones in the top two, right? It's revolutionary breakthrough. So when the business books are telling you to take risks, to experiment, to, right, to make mistakes, 
They aren't telling you really to take it in the sustained evolutionary space. They're telling you to take risks in revolutionary and breakthrough innovations. Those are the innovations we want if you really want to take risks, because they're not very successful. And here's the here. So again, still not from a mathematician's perspective, but this is probably more representative, right? It's more scale to what it would look like if I add this third, uh, third uh, axis here. OK, a little more realistic. Now, if I change this third axis, right, I give a little hint to it already. It's still not mathematically correct. But if I change it now and call it probability of success, right? I gave it away, right? Which ones have the highest probability of success? The ones that are blue and red or the ones that are green? The ones that are green, right? We have greater, higher probability of success with evolutionary and uh, sustaining innovations. It's because your, your targeted users, your targeted market already exists. You, have, you can do market research. You can get the data. When you're doing things for new markets, we have no idea what's going to happen, right? It's called an experiment. We've heard a little bit about that from some of the talks today. If you remember uh, Colonel Stanton's opening address, at the very end, he said, be brave, right? What else do you say? Be brave, be, yeah, be brave, be creative. Yeah, be brave, be creative. That's what this talk is about. I'm hoping to encourage creativity, but in the right ways now. Hopefully, if you understand what quadrants of innovation that you're targeting, either as individuals or as a group or as a company, you might have greater success. That's the hope I'm uh, getting from this talk. Again, still not from a mathematician's perspective, uh, but this is probably what these quadrants will look like more representative, scale-wise, if I add that third axis, probably success. So let's take a look now. Again, I tell my cadets, right, prove it to me in numbers. So it's this notion of revolutions. I looked at, not too far, right, using history, this notion of the Green Revolt that happened in uh, 1910, 1911. Uh, so not too far away, right? Uh, five, six years ago. A little bit of history lesson, possibly some recent events. Remember how many countries revolted during this time period? It was amazing. Social media had a lot to do with it, right? The uh, WikiLeaks, when they released our cables, our State Department cables, US State Department cables, that said a lot of our allies in this country, or in this region, our uh, uh, tend to be uh, pretty corrupt. Yeah, that uh, kind of stirred the uh, emotions of a lot of people in these countries. Start with Tunisia. Tunisia quickly spread to 13 other countries. So again, small data size, right? We had someone talked about that in a previous presentation. 14 countries, N equals 14. But this is kind of interesting. How many of these countries actually uh, successfully revolted where their king or their leader was deposed immediately. I'm not saying years later, immediately deposed. Well, the first one, let's see, the first one, the first one was Tunisia, where it started, Tunisia. It also happened in Yemen. They're still having problems there, but that, the king left. He flew out to uh, England somewhere. Uh, I'm sorry, that was, uh, that was Egypt. Egypt. Uh, yeah. Yemen. And the fourth, let me see, fourth was Libya, right? Gaddafi, Gaddafi fell, right? He was killed two years later. Um, so four out of 14, all right? So if you want to do the math there, you can. I've done it already, so I, right, I don't like having generals do math in public, so I do the math for them. But I don't really consider Egypt a revolutionary success. What happened in Egypt? Military took over, right? So that's not really a revolution. That's a coup, a military coup. And being in the military myself, I just know how dangerous militaries are, right? The military is trained to fight. They are equipped to fight. They have leadership that can take over the country if we want to, which is why from the US perspective, all the military folks in here know it. That's why they move us every three years or so. They don't like having less stability, right? Well, we sort of learned from the Romans, right? The funny was sort of figure, what, what was bad with the Roman armies, the Roman legions? It was very dangerous when they marched close to Rome. You wanted those Roman legions out fighting the barbarians, right? Out of, out of Rome, right? When they cross the Rubicon, when they come back to Rome, bad things happen. Remember Julius Caesar? If you're a senator, that was bad, right? <laughs> Military coup. So I don't count Egypt as a revolution. So here are the stats. 
I was actually surprised by this, how high this was. I was actually thinking the single digits. But yeah, I'm using this as a, an analogy for describing, at least mathematically, in one instance, uh, what are probably success for revolution. 21% in this case. I know we have uh, still a question mark in Syria. Yeah, Syria is still debatable, right? Unfortunately, with my studies in counterinsurgency operations and insurgent forces, the fact that Russia has stepped in against the US, right? And the fact that Assad is fighting those forces aggressively, it is not looking good for the insurgencies. Yeah. Don't believe the hype that says long wars favor insurgents. Long wars do not favor the insurgents. It only favors them if they have the willpower. If they run out of US support, they run out of logistics, uh, insurgencies fail very quickly. Okay. And they can get rid of the leadership very quickly. That they, not the number one guy. You have to kill the number one guy and the number two guy. Right? A lot of folks miss that. You have to kill the number two guy as well. Okay, so getting back to this notion of, okay, so this makes it a little bit more realistic, right? Maybe 20%, okay, maybe single digits, some of you might think single digits. But I like to think of it as major league batting averages, right? Okay, that's a little easier for me to remember. Major league batting averages. Okay. The problem is Hollywood, once again, Hollywood gives us the impression that revolutions are easy. Right? We watch all these movies. Game of Thrones, right? Revolutions are easy, right? Get rid of the king. New king. I'm not really thinking Game of Thrones here. I told you, I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm a Star Wars fan. Okay, so instead of those knights, I'm thinking Jedi knights. Remember these two movies? Episode 4 and episode 0.5, I guess. Hollywood gives the impression revolution are easy. Very dangerous, right? If you think about our forefathers, Tough business, right? It was, it was really. I'll cut the sound. I'll cut the sound. Yeah, the sound's gone now. Yeah, because really, when the empire figures it out, right? And the empire figures out these rebels are causing a problem, right? In this evolutionary space, what did Darth Vader come up with to take care of the uh, rebels? What's that in the this breakthrough? The Death Star. The Death Star is a breakthrough innovation, right? It takes a long time to build. It's because the, Re the rebels destroyed two of them, right? At least two of them, right? One they destroyed one, and then the Star Wars episode, they destroyed another one, right? Long lead times, lots of RD, lots of manpower to create that thing. The rebels, all they just needed to do was use the force, right? Use the force and destroy it. But uh, once Darth Vader figured out, very bad news for revolutionaries, right? So that's, that's a more realistic impression, I think. Uh, that's why, for me, Star Wars Episode 5 was a better episode as well. You might debate me on that, but that's okay. Let's see. Another way of looking at this, instead of looking at it as a quadrant, you look at it as a timeline. Okay. This came really, I'm going to show the, the uh, site, the authors again. But this notion of these green innovations, right, sustaining and evolutionary, it's really, it's not like there's no improvement over time. It does improve over time, but it's, it's incremental, small changes. There's breakthrough innovations, if you look on your graph here, is that it jumps the curve. That's why I call breakthrough in parentheses, jumping the curve. Right? You're actually going beyond what the market needs. Right? That's innovation, right? it's changing the environment, it has the potential, it's successful. What about revolutionary innovations? Where do they start off? It's revolution, you don't have the same resources as folks in green. Right? That's why I love thinking about this in terms of military revolution. You are starting off at the bottom. Okay? And not only are you worse off, Right? If you're a market and you're trying to sell products that are on the revolutionary scale, you are initially far worse, number three, initially far worse on one or two mainstream areas. So how do these things succeed? Right? Uh, this notion of uh, disruptive innovations came from two Harvard Business School professors, Joseph Bauer and Clayton Christensen. It's amazing. They studied this, this what they thought was uh, seemingly contradictory. How can folks that create products that are far worse than what the market already has succeed? I told you the percentage are small, right? Major League Bang Average as well. Let's think about some of these. Xerox versus Canon. I'm thinking about the older folks in the room. Uh, does anyone remember what the print divisions were at your companies, even like an academic institution? Well, how big was those print divisions? Remember print divisions. I'm not talking about a copier room. A print division could be the quarter of the size of this room, the auditorium room here. Huge. It's because Xerox kept focusing on the best customer. We teach that to our 
We teach that to our business majors. Go for the highest profit margins. So when you go for the highest profit margin, you're going for the big, big things. Your customers are the academic institutions, they're the IBMs, right? They're the uh, big companies that can afford and want the latest features. What can it do? How did Canon disrupt Xerox? They brought it home. Yeah, they, they went for the, what was that? They brought it home. They brought, that was their market, right? The new market was no longer big companies. Their new market was home-based business. Was it inferior to Xerox? Xerox laughed at Canon, right, when they came out with that uh, home-based printer, especially the uh, e check ones. They laughed at them. Um, yeah, but what was the what was the appeal? What was the value that made it so appealing for the canon? That mark was larger. The mark was larger, but really, what was the one? What was that one criteria that made the home base business want to like? Yeah, you remember the print dimensions, multi million dollars. If you're a home base business, you can't uh, grow your business in a lifetime to have a print division. Right? You can't afford a home based copier, right? At the time, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Still expensive, right, relatively what we have to see today. But compared to a Xerox printer, holy smokes, you can afford that. Same thing with, right, IBM Apple. What did Apple focus on? Colonel Stanton mentioned he had that Apple IIe, right? Green screens. Cheaper, focused on now consumers. IBM focused on mainframes, right? IBM, IBM laughed at Apple. Why would any logical person want to buy a home-based computer when we have these great mainframes, right? 10 times the speed, computationally. Right? Computationally, they're on the green line, superior to the Apple IIe. But IBM laughed at Apple. Apple uh, appealed to the home-based market. And again, it was inferior. Yeah, the Apple IIe is inferior to the, uh, that, uh, that mainframe computer. But over time, as more and more people buy it, what we see is right, better performance in those PCs to where the point intersects. We've passed that point now, right? Of course, we might be going back when we talk about cloud. But, uh, okay. Another example, okay, how the, how the tech business. Who remembers the, uh, back in 19, late 1970s? Right? All these folks grew up thinking Toyotas, Hondas, are, those are good vehicles, right? Back in the 70s. Who, who thought a Honda too is a great vehicle back in the 70s? They're small, right? They don't have a lot of acceleration. I think the attributes for the American vehicle was I like uh, space, a lot of space. We like power, right? We like that vehicle to go fast, uh, very quickly. What brought about this change? This wasn't really a market, uh, consumer market uh, decision. This is more of an external. Oil in 73. What was it? Yeah, oil embargo. Yeah, oil embargo. 1979, right? 1979, oil embargo. So what became the, the feature, that one feature that uh, folks wanted, the new market wanted? Fuel efficiency. Fuel efficiency, right? Gas prices doubled, essentially, overnight. Um, so it was, uh, this was an external shock that caused us to market behavior to shift. Okay. Uh, more modern day example. More modern day example. This actually came from an audience member. He asked me a question on this. Does this, does this even still happen today? Yeah. Blackberry. Anyone still use Blackberry? I, I saw one earlier today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, governments. I told you, right? Governments. So we, we are the high tech, right? We, we can't beat Congress. The, the government, they give us Blackberries. Yeah. It still has some security features that are still nice, but their market share is 1% now. At the height, when President Obama, when he was uh, doing called the Crackberry, uh, Blackberry Rim had about 21% market share. About 1% now. They do have their own smartphone now, but to compete with the likes of Google, LG, Samsung, Huawei, all these Chinese companies, they probably won't be able to survive. Uh, iPhone, Android. And again, uh, if, you, if you attended Jason's talk on uh, presentation styles, I've given you, right, I've given you the concrete examples here, right? There's no way to, this thing, I'm gonna give you a little more flexibility here, right? When you, when you think about other examples today, it exists all over the place. So if you have the question of whether revolutionary uh, innovations exist, think about sports. Does it? Revolutionary innovation take place in sports? Everyone read Michael Luce's Moneyball? Sabermetrics? 
The notion that you can beat, or get, at least get close to beating a Yankees or a Red Sox when you're the Oakland A's, by just by using statistics. Isn't statistics readily available? We've talked about that in a lot, a lot of talks today, right? You heard about that? That's revolutionary. If you leverage that, and you go against the conventional grain, which was, oh, that pitcher's got a funky looking uh, pitch, right? Go against the grain of the, uh, the uh, traditional sp uh, sports scouts. Okay. Use statistics. What about TV shows? <coughs> Aren't we inundated with reality TV, game shows? Those are revolutionary innovations. Very cheap. It doesn't cost much to write a script, right? For reality TV, there is no script. You're just editing, right? And edit in less than five seconds. That's what I learned also in Jason's talk. Uh, movies, do we have examples of revolutionary movies? Very cheap movies that did very well. Blair Witch. Blair Witch, that's what came to my mind. Yeah. Of course, there's also examples of high, uh, the breakthrough ones too, right? Transformers, all that high tech CGI. News, what about news? Yeah, a 24 hour cycle. I, the I reporter, right? Anyone can report on the news now, and CNN will take it up. That's why HLN is no longer even called headline news, right? It's like a mystery channel now. Mm. Holy smokes. Yeah, even CNN is being disrupted by uh, uh, disruptive news. Restaurants? Fast, casual, and food trucks. Yeah, every, actually, almost every single restaurant that starts up, unless you're a chain, right? Franchisee, you're, if you're a franchisee, you're in this green space. Right? Any new restaurant really is a disruptive innovation, revolution. You think your food is better than everyone else's. That's when you start with. Do you have experience? Do you have the market? Yeah. Probably not. You're trying to cater new markets. Technology, right? Et cetera. And this goes on and on forever. So again, disruptive, revolutionary innovations are taking place every day. Everyone walks Shark Tank. That is all revolution and innovations, right? So if you understand this space, right? Revolutionary innovations, you cannot get money from banks. Banks give money to folks in this green space. You need venture capitalists, angel investors, bridge investors to get this red space. What about blue space if you're looking for money? Who funds blue space? Governments. Yeah, governments. So Air Force, right? The Air Force needs it. The governments will fund it if you're a smart government. So you'll be doing it if you're a smart government. That's why I really don't, uh, I don't, I don't disparage breakthrough innovations. I'm just trying to promote more revolutionary innovations. Let's see now. Yeah, so really this notion of, I sort of gave it away, right? How can we best protect cyberspace if you're both a defender, right? Everyone in this room, we're trying to do that. Even if you're a pen tester, you're actually trying to make defense better. So what are the innovations that we need? Well, yeah, I focus this talk on revolutionary innovations. We do need that. But we also need breakthrough innovations. We also need sustaining evolutionary. So really, we need all types of innovations. But what this framework tells you, though, is if you really want to take risks, if you want to change the market, then you want to go for the top two. If you want to go for the low hanging fruit and the immediate victories, go for the bottom two. Right? So it gives you a framework for how you can do things. If you're an individual company, right, with less than 50 people, you're probably going to be in the revolutionary space. If you're a vendor that's outside getting government contracts, yeah, then go for the breakthrough. Okay? So it gives you a, a framework for what types of innovation are, are most appropriate uh, for your success. And that's what we want, right? Successful innovations. Here's the problem if you do not consider disruptive revolutionary innovations home. Again, this is coming from a military perspective as a military officer. The wars that we didn't win, okay? So wars that we didn't win, starting with the Korean War. What happened in the Korean War? Yeah, we actually beat the North Koreans, right? The North Koreans did not have an army. Mark Arthur pushed them all back. Uh, North Koreans were decimated. They had no military. China came in. Uh, estimates were anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 initially crossing the Yalu from October of 1950 through December of 1950. Uh, overall, about a million. Chinese volunteer, right? Yes, a lot of volunteers. Uh, <laughs> but what was it the Chinese did? Well, let's ask, let's, let me ask you this point, different way. What did MacArthur rely on? This was, again, 1950, coming out of World War II. What was his intelligence asset that he liked? What just came into, air, we had airplanes, they had this neat little gadget on it. They took pictures. What film, right? So it's what film. So what film became the new breakthrough innovation for the US military? Yeah, we have nice reconnaissance aircraft. What's the problem with what film technology? You need light right? in the darkness. It's black. The Chinese military, whether or not they knew it or not, when they ordered their soldiers to conduct movements, huge maneuvers, strictly at night by punishment of death, right? The one 
Chinese captain that had the pistol and just shot them. Right? They were just moving forward. Um, they were moving at night. Uh, General MacArthur's J2 consistently underestimated the Chinese strength by a factor of 10. You can under, from military perspective, you can underestimate by three. If you underestimate by 10, you're going to lose uh, a bunch of time. That's tough ground combat if you're significantly uh, underestimating your enemy forces. What about Vietnam War? We talked about Vietnam earlier where there was success really with the US Navy, not so much with the US uh, uh, Air Force, but there's also this notion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The fact that we could bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail and just obliterate the Viet Cong, Viet, uh, North Vietnamese supply lines. What's the problem with that notion if your supply lines aren't tied to this uh, supply trail? It's not tied to infrastructure. There's a crater there, right? If you're dismounted, you just go around it, right? Dismounted operations that you're learning from Boulder. Dismounted is, right, this notion of no low terrain doesn't exist for dismounted operations. <laughs> That's what happened, right? We bombed the heck out of Ho Chi Minh Trail initially. It did no effect, right? The uh, supply lines continue going. Now, over time, right, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, they developed the road networks because it was so successful. Again, we stopped our bombing campaign for, for all of 1969 as well. When that happened, yeah, the Viet, <laughs> Viet Cong said, hey, let's build the road networks, get our supplies faster. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan. What was the number one killer or number one memer on the battlefield? Yeah, what does IED stand for? Improvised explosion. Yeah, in the very name of it is telling you this is a revolutionary disruptive, right? It's improvised. It's not even a weapon system. It's an improvised weapon. Okay? So that's an improvised weapon system that's causing fatality. Sure, over time it improved, right? Over time it went to sustaining. Over time, right, if they started using copper uh, IEDs, copper plates. So it moved over, but initially, very crude weapon systems, right? It was uh, dudded weapons, dudded munitions found along the battlefield. Cyber warfare. My argument is that the first instance of most malware is disruptive and revolutionary. Anyone want to counter me on that? There are some examples of breakthrough. I'm thinking Stuxnet. But again, in this form, I can't, I can't confirm or deny that the US or Israel had any involvement with Stuxnet. But if you watch the movie Zero Days, right, that's why as an academic, right, I'm citing Zero Days. If you watch the movie Zero Days, it says the US and Israel had some involvement with releasing that malware. I can't confirm it by that. Uh, let's see now. For cyber offense, so this notion of where cyber offense resides in this quadrant, I'm thinking really it's not just, it's not just revolutionary, right? It does exist in sustaining, it does exist in, it also exists in breakthrough, but a very small amount. Right? I'm thinking Stuxnet, right? Very, uh, a lot of complicated pieces that went into making Stuxnet successful, especially Stuxnet 1.0. I'm not talking about Stuxnet uh, 0.1 through 0.9. Stuxnet 1.0, especially if you watch Zero Days, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, now, if you contrast this with cyber defense, right? Cyber defense, yeah, we're doing a lot of breakthrough, right? The US government does a lot of breakthrough, we contract a lot of that. Evolutionary exists, sustaining. I don't think we're doing as much revolutionary cyber defense. Now, I'm excluding folks from this room. If you're doing pen testing, you guys are, uh, I think you're doing uh, revolutionary uh, uh, defense. But my argument is, if you look at these two graphs side by side, again, as a military intelligence officer, there's a gap. Breakthrough innovations for uh, offense really doesn't need to exist, right? There's so many back doors that you can find. You can, you can stay in the revolutionary space. If you're on the defensive side, however, if we give up on the revolutionary defensive measures, <coughs> we're giving the attacker too much time, right? Because I already told you, characteristics of breakthrough innovations, expensive, lots of lead time. But again, both revolutionary and breakthrough innovations have the same probability of success. So if you're leaving that gap, you're exposing yourself to a lot of time where the adversary has the ability to not only do revolutionary, but go down to sustaining an evolutionary as well. And that is, makes it tough for the defensive side. That's my, my argument for this uh, presentation. And here, really, this is my, uh, I think this is my second to last slide. This is where I get my text, right? Uh, uh, Jason, in that previous talk on presentations, he says, yeah, talk about stories. Yeah, this is really my, my final, my final thoughts, so I will go through this slowly, just as Jason recommended. Okay, most revolutions 
fail. Just remember that. Don't believe Star Wars, right? Don't believe Star Wars. Most revolutions fail, but that's where the greatest change happens. So if you're looking to make uh, experiments, if you're looking to do innovation that's uh, groundbreaking and causes lots of change, look in the revolutionary and breakthrough space. Because it's tough, because once right Darth Vader figures out you're doing that, if they're smart, they don't laugh at you. If they're smart, they're going to try to take that space away from you. They're going to control market share rather than the innovation itself. Green is, again, the uh, sustaining and uh, incremental innovations. Now, if you want to encourage revolutionary innovations, the best way is the last one. You want to be an early adopter of experimentation. Uh, preferably cheap, fast, and uh, many, many iterations. You want many iterations. So we learned that in, in elementary school, right? When you're doing experiments, don't pull off your first one. You do it many times. Sample size n, you want bigger. Okay. Bigger than 30, right? Sample size n bigger than 30. Uh, so uh, fast and cheap, though. That's what it's got to be. Uh, I, was a, I was a NASA fellow, so I saw a lot of what NASA was trying to do, trying to be disruptive. It was just not in their DNA. That's why I say it for the Air Force. Air Force, I will not give an Air Force contract for them to be disruptive. They are so ingrained in that blue space for breakthrough, I'm going to keep them there, right? They like satellites, and they like high-tech stuff, I'm going to keep them there. From the military, who do I think is great for disruptive? But more specific, Navy did some things, right? I told you Top Gun. SEALs, right? SEALs, they have to rely on themselves. Small man teams, 12 man teams at most. SEALs are great. Special forces for the Army. Hopefully our cyber teams, hopefully our cyber teams are thinking this way. Disruptive innovations. Experiment. I also like Coast Guard. I like the Marines. I like the Marines. Because uh, again, they are right, the Coast Guard and the Marines get the leftovers from the Navy and the Army. So they have to make it work. Yeah, a lot of that's still in the same world, but if they make it work well, that's uh, for me a revolutionary style. Now, attributes of when you do it right, when you do experimentation right, right, be bold, be creative, right, which turns this outside the box thinking. Uh, Hopefully what it does is it creates this notion of being more creative and being able to take risks. Okay, that's really the bottom line, I think, of uh, really what uh, Colonel Stanton was talking about earlier this morning in the keynote speech. Yeah, here, here is my last slide. The, really thing, the last thing I really wanted to get out here is, like, just like our military, uh, our failures right, in the Korean War, Vietnam War, even the failures in Iraq and Afghanistan, even failures right now in the cyber conflict. We're not, we're not at war. Our chief of staff of the Army says we're not at cyber war. We're getting, we're getting attacked though, right? Yeah, everyone in this room probably will be getting attacked. We're not technically not at war. If we don't do experiments though, what we're left with is we're left with the evolutionary sustaining innovations. Right? We might have some breakthrough, right? The Air Force I know loves doing that. DARPA is doing a lot of that. NASA is doing a lot of that. Yeah. Now, if we don't do re revolutionary innovation, the problem is right, we, get, we don't do these failures. We don't get to learn from this space. That's the problem. We're not learning. Right? We keep saying we're a learning organization. We said that a lot through the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Right? We say we're a learning organization. Let's prove it. Let's experiment. Because I don't want to be a military that's just a non-zero defects mentality. Th does anyone remember that, that terminology? We said that. That was like a great thing. And the Army is on, right? Colin Powell used to say that. Right? He's talked about his mistakes and how he survived and became a chief staff in the Army and then uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. I don't want to just be a non-zero defects mentality Army. It's great that we're doing that, right? Yeah, we don't fire folks, right? Especially for you lieutenants. Yeah, we don't fire folks immediately for making mistakes, right? Judgment call. But I want to go beyond just the non-zero defects mentality. I want us to be with an experimenting frame of mind. Now we want to, especially right in this red space, I want us to be revolutionary experimenters. Low cost, cheap, many experiments. Yeah, I'll let the Air Force, they're doing experiments too on the breakthrough side, but they have a better uh, DNA with making success out of uh, those types of experiments. Those are expensive though. If you fail in that area, uh, that's tough. Again, same, right? At best, uh, major league bag numbers. I think with that, uh, here's a citation of all the, uh, I think all the movies and all the uh, quotes that I used. Um, very big thanks to Philip and the uh, B-Size team. Everyone in green here, thank you. Uh, the Army Cyber Institute, we host our own conference. Um, again, my very first iteration of this talk 
uh, that Mike Nowakowski, Dr. Nowakowski uh, moderated was at the last uh, U.S. cyclone that took place in October of last year. Our very next one is six to seven, I'm sorry, seven to eight November in Washington, D.C. Uh, so if you're interested in attending, we cap our attendance at 500, uh, but uh, we still are, I think, except, no, 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 the call for papers is, is done. Uh, just so you know, I got rejected from uh, round two. Uh, so again, a lot of great speakers should be at this conference. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, that's why I know how, how, mu how much effort goes into the production of a uh, conference like this. I want to thank uh, everyone in the green shirt, everyone in the, in the gray shirts, and uh, Phil and everyone in the blue shirts for putting on this uh, great, uh, great conference. Um, with that, uh, I conclude the presentation and uh, welcome any questions that you might have. Uh, how much time do I have for questions?